Well, I'm delighted to be here at Aspen to talk about my latest book, Design as an Attitude. And I'm going to begin with the designer who inspired its title. And it's one of my design heroes, who, of course, you'll all recognize as the wonderful Laszlo Moulinage. I have many design heroines, of course, but in a spirit of gender equality, I have heroes too. And Moulinage is one of my firm favorites. I mean, he is, of course, an absolutely irresistible figure, the brilliant artist designer and visual theorist who really dominated the field in the early 20th century in terms of his radicalism and whose ideas and writing continue to influence visual theory today. And he was also an innate radical. Here he is wearing the factory worker's boiler suit that he wore every day to teach at the Bauhaus to symbolize his faith and to convince his students of it, of the power of science and technology to help us to build a better world. And while he was at the Bauhaus, it was he who really molded the school into the crucible of modernity and technocracy that we associate with it today. He also critically allowed women for the first time to study whichever subjects they wished, rather than being shoehorned into the so-called women's section where they could study weaving, ceramics, bookbinding, and nothing else. Um, he he was equally radical when he came here to the United States after he fled Nazi Germany in the mid-1930s. Um, he settled in Chicago and he founded not one but two radical design schools in which he planned to reinvent the Bauhaus. And while he was there equally bravely at a time when the city's education system was strictly segregated, he welcomed African-American students and teachers to both schools. And wherever he was in the world, and regardless of his personal circumstances, which were all often financially precarious, Moulinage was always generous, optimistic, subversive, curious, and completely committed to experimentation, whether it was with the then new media of film and photography, or in terms of his vision of design and visual culture. Because critically, his theories reinvented the practice of design by liberating it from the commercial constraints imposed since the Industrial Revolution and redefining it as a much more instinctive, improvisational, and naturally resourceful medium. And he articulated this vision of design in his 1947 book, Vision in Motion. Now, Moulinage, tragically, was dying of leukemia when he wrote the book, but he was so determined to finish it that he pressed his wife, Sybil, to bring his notes, his research, and all his other materials to his hospital room so he could complete the book between treatments and x-rays. He died in November 1946, and Vision in Motion was published the following year, and it presented an unusually eclectic and empowering vision of design, which he summed up in the title of the second chapter with these words, designing is not a profession, but an attitude. And I first read those words many years ago, and I'm as charmed by them now as I was then, because quaint and grammatically incorrect, though the word designing seems to us now, it is a really wonderful way of summing up design. And I've always admired Moulinage's conviction that design should be, as he wrote, transformed from the notion of a specialist function into a generally valid attitude of resourcefulness and inventiveness. And who could wish for more than that? And his vision of design was, of course, rooted in his commitment to the constructivist movement in um, Budapest, in his native Hungary, in immediately after World War I. And Design was central to the work of the original constructivists, this ferociously cool couple. Um, the avant-garde Russian artists Alexander Rodchenko and his wife Varvara Stepanova, and they with friends like El Lizitsky and Yubov Popova were founders of the constructivist movement in revolutionary Russia. They believed that artists, designers, scientists, and industrialists should collaborate to build a fairer, more progressive society, and that that new world would need, as Popova put it, new things for the new life. And that was the vision of design that Moulinage introduced to the Bauhaus in the mid-1920s and to his Chicago design schools in the late 1930s and early 1940s. And I chose the phrase, design as an attitude, as the title of my new book, 
both as a personal tribute to Leslie Moulinage, because I always found him such a compelling figure, but also because I believe that his concept of design as an attitudinal or improvisational discipline, steeped in experimentation, is a defining force in design today. When a new generation of designers, some professionally trained, others not, are seizing their chance to work independently in pursuit of their own social, political, and ecological and entrepreneurial goals. But before I explain what I believe attitudinal design means in a contemporary context, I'm going to talk about what I believe design is in general. And of course, design is something that's phenomenally difficult to practice and phenomenally difficult to write about, because it's a murky, muddled, confusing, cliche-ridden concept that's meant many different things at different times and in different circumstances. But I believe that in all of its multiple guises, design has always had one elemental role, and it's as this. Because design is an agent of change, which can help us to make sense of what's happening, and if we're lucky, to turn it to our advantage. In other words, to ensure that those changes will be interpreted in such a way that they will affect us positively rather than negatively. And this applies to changes of any type, social, political, cultural, ecological, scientific, technological, whatever. And design was practiced in the instinctive and resourceful way that Moulinage articulated, not just for centuries, but for millennia, long, long before a word was invented to describe it. Because whenever human beings have tried to change their way of life or their surroundings, to modify their behavior or other people's, they have acted as designers. But of course, for a long, long time, they did so intuitively and unknowingly. So think of the prehistoric historic men and women who sharpen sticks, stones and animal bones into tools to battle with and uh, tool, sorry, tools to sort of work the land and weapons to battle with, or who molded clay into vessels to eat and drink from. They were acting as designers, but were doing so entirely intuitively. And many subsequent design feats, some of them surprisingly enduring, began in the same entirely instinctive way. And one of my favorites is this. It's the raised fist. It has signified strength and unity in the face of violence and oppression f for 3,000 years since ancient Assyria. And it's an absolutely brilliant example of communication design, not just because that simple symbol that anyone can do with no money and very little effort is internationally recognized for meaning unity in the face of oppression. And the physical gesture of raising and clenching your fist, I can't clench it properly because I'm holding the clicker, um, it actually makes you feel stronger because the blood flows down your veins. So you feel powerful, confident, optimistic, and ready to take on the world, and oppressive baddies in particular. Now, and this is why it's been used as a symbol of radicalism for movements from the Russian revolutionaries, workers' rights activists in the early 20th century, the civil rights movement in the 1960s and the women's movement, to activists like these in Black Lives Matter. And an only slightly younger emblem is equally recognizable. It's this, the white flag, which has signified surrender and the end of conflict for over 2,000 years. And like the clenched fist, it's instantly recognizable globally. Nor has design ever lost its necessity as the mother of invention role for resourceful people in challenging circumstances. And one of my favorites of these unknowing and rather improbable pioneering designers is the woman who designed these, Florence Nightingale, who's famous in Britain and I think in other countries too, as a healthcare reformer in the mid 19th century. She came from a very wealthy British family who were horrified when she volunteered to work as a nurse in British military clinics in Turkey during the Crimean War. And when she got there, she was appalled to discover that more patients were dying of the infections they caught in the filthy fetid wards than from their battle wounds. So being a resourceful woman, she decided to do something about it. Nightingale consulted John Roberton, who was a doctor in Manchester in England, who had designed model civilian hospitals with cleanliness and safety in mind. She adapted his design principles for military use 
and mounted a vigorous campaign to persuade the British government, which was initially both sceptical and reluctant, to fund them. And here she showed her design acumen again, not simply in designing cleaner, safer, lighter area, more sanitary clinics, but in becoming a pioneer of information design. Because Florence Nightingale knew she had very complex and unpopular arguments that she needed to convey as clearly and as accurately as possible. So she used pie charts which were then very newfangled devices that were rarely used because they did so so brilliantly and these are still recognised as some of the best uses of this form. And she then mounted a similar campaign to build model modern civilian hospitals after the war. But by then, by the late 19th century, the design process had, of course, for some time been applied not just instinctively, but knowingly and systematically to manufacture huge quantities of goods at affordable prices and, and of consistent quality since the dawn of the Industrial Age. Now, the practice of design was formalised as a result of this. Design schools were opened, so were specialist training programmes, and special classifications of design were introduced. Design became professionalised by this, but I believe it was then that it was really restricted to a commercial role, something that was generally seen as being executed under instruction from someone else. And this, for me, was the beginning of its diminution. I mean, design achieved extraordinary things in its industrial guise and will continue to do so. But the misconceptions of design that developed at the time, the cliches and stereotypes around it, really stereotyped it as a promotional or a styling tool, something that was much more focused on superficial changes, styling rather than substance. Now, of course, there were always maverick exceptions, like Laszlo Moulinage himself, and this familiar character, one of my favourite US designers, the brilliant Richard Buckminster Fuller. Designer, architect, engineer, self-styled astronaut of spaceship Earth, and an environmental seer, Bucky realised the damage that industrialisation was causing to the environment as early as the 1920s, and he spent much of his working life campaigning to persuade young designers to devote their careers to combating this. But despite his efforts and that of other engaging mavericks, attitudinal design was very much on the sidelines of design culture for, during the 20th century. But all that's changed because in recent years, design has experienced a radical metamorphosis into the fluid, expansive and open-ended medium that Laszlo Moulinage envisaged in Vision in Motion. Now, the chief catalyst for this, apart from the determination, ingenuity and sheer talent of the designers involved, is the plethora of very familiar, readily accessible digital tools that have transformed the practice and possibilities of design. Most of them are basic and inexpensive, but if imaginatively applied, have proved remarkably useful in enabling designers not only to operate independently, to be much more ambitious and eclectic in their choice of goals. For starters, something as boringly familiar as crowdfunding campaigns have enabled designers to raise significant sums of capital. So to put this in context, one of the most successful design crowdfunding campaigns was for this project, which is also one of the boldest and most high profile of the attitudinal design projects I'm talking about. It is, of course, the Ocean Cleanup which was founded four years ago by the young Dutch design engineer Boyan Slat to develop a way of clearing the plastic trash that's poisoning our oceans and is one of the biggest pollution problems of our time. He managed to raise, largely through crowdfunding, but also grants and donations, over $40 million in four years, which is obviously a huge sum of money. And as we'll see, this gave him considerable muscle and freedom in developing his project. Designers can also now manage huge quantities of complex data on affordable computers. And they can use things as familiar as social media platforms to raise awareness of their work in order to flush out collaborators, fabricators and suppliers, uh, to clinch more funding and generate more media coverage. Individually, any of these changes would have had an impact on design, as they have in most other sectors and most other areas of our lives. But collectively, they have proved transformational.
And it's just as well, because I would argue that we need design's power as an agent of change more urgently now than at any time I can remember, because we face radical and ominous changes on so many fronts. I mean, it's a terrifying situation, which was summed up brilliantly by one of my favourite banners at a Women's March on London, this. Too much to put on one sign. Now, I could rattle on for days about all the horrible developments in contemporary life that could have been up there, but just for a very quick um, list. The climate emergency, of course, and its dire political, economic, and environmental consequences as parts of Africa face their worst famines in their history. The growing imbalance of wealth between rich and poor, young and old distrust of the political establishment, the rise of intolerance, prejudice, bigotry, and heaven help us in Britain, Brexit, and the crisis of social justice. Ever more terrifying terrorist and cyber attacks and killing sprees, and of course the deepening refugee crisis, as tens of millions, 70 million people, are forced to flee their homes and to struggle to rebuild their lives. And then of course there are accelerating advances in science and technology. After a decade in which technologies like this tended to be seen as sci-fi props in movies, they have become ubiquitous parts of our daily lives. This is, of course, an artificial intelligence-powered public surveillance system. We desperately need design to help us to identify constructive applications for technologies like this and to steer us away from their dangers and then to do the same with neuromorphic and quantum computing, blockchain and all the other innovations that we know are going to be more and more important to our lives and future. Of course, identifying useful applications for inscrutable technologies was one of design's most important and valuable roles in the industrial age, but it's taken on a new urgency now, given the power of the next wave of advances and their potential to wreak havoc and destruction in our lives. So think of the current paranoia and all the media scare stories about artificial intelligence and the implications of the design flaws of systems like this one, which have already been accused of distorting data bias in terms of gender and ethnicity. Design, of course, is not a panacea for any of the problems I've talked about, but it can help us to address them intelligently, responsibly, and constructively. And the new attitudinal designers are already grappling with these problems and devising solutions for them. There are lots and lots of examples in my book, and I'm just gonna talk about a few of them, starting with the ocean cleanup. Now, it was founded by Boyan Slat when he was a 19-year-old design engineering student after he came back from a diving holiday in Greece where he'd been horrified to notice that he saw more plastic in the water than fish. His vision is to design one of the world's largest floating structures to collect, contain, and clear plastic trash from the huge garbage patches in our oceans and then to take it onto dry land and recycle it responsibly. His plans have been fiercely criticised throughout the development process. Environmentalists have said that they'll damage marine life, and scientists have said that they're completely bonkers and they won't work. But because Boyan Slat raised $40 million, he was able to ignore the critics and to continue to design, test and prototype the rig, which went live in the Pacific last autumn. Now, a very different way, but an equally ingenious one, of using design to combat climate change is Ore Streams, which is an ongoing research project executed by the Italian designers Andrea Tremarche and Simone Farrison of Studio Forma Fantasma. And the aim of their project, it's a design research project, is to investigate and chart the colossal, largely illicit, global trade in digital waste, much of which ends up in hellholes like this. This is the notorious Apgogloshi dump near Accra in Ghana, and this is where so much of the digital debris that we discard mindlessly in the West goes to fail to decompose and poisons the ground for centuries to come.
Now, as well as documenting the shipments of waste from country to country in their project and assessing its social and economic impact there, Andrea and Simone have also identified very simple practical steps that designers, manufacturers and recyclers can take in order to ensure that more digital devices like computers, phones, tablets and so on are recycled responsibly. And in order to do this, they consulted widely manufacturers, other designers, recyclers, scientists, ecologists, um, people from government agencies, including Interpol, and so on. And to put the problem in context, currently fewer than a third of the digital devices discarded in the European Union alone every year are actually recycled responsibly. And just as Laszlo Moulinage urged designers to engage with other disciplines by forging collaborations with specialists from other fields, as former Phantasma and the Ocean Cleanup have done. He also envisaged the reverse happening and people from outside design starting to experiment directly with it. And among them is the British social scientist Hilary Cotton, who became convinced of design's usefulness in addressing complex social and economic problems when she was running water projects for the World Bank in Africa. Hillary realised that there was a big difference between the success and failure of individual projects, so sensibly she decided to investigate why. Like most British intellectuals, she knew nothing about design or thought she didn't, so she was puzzled to realise that the quality of the design of those projects was the single most important factor in determining their success or failure. So she decided to investigate whether design could be applied to other issues that she was concerned with. Back in Britain, she founded a social enterprise called Participal, and its mission was to reinvent the welfare state by designing new solutions for urgent social problems, whether it's caring for the elderly, homelessness, social isolation, and long-term unemployment. Traditionally, a designer's role in tackling problems like that tended to be limited to designing a brochure or a website explaining the decisions that specialists from other fields had taken. But Hillary embedded designers in the heart of the development process for all these new systems that she developed. She believed that design enables you to have much looser, more lateral thinking when you're analysing existing problems and to be much bolder and more imaginative and open-minded when developing solutions. So she would form teams of relevant specialists to tackle problems such as developing a more cost-effective and efficient way of caring for the elderly but she would put a designer, generally one who trained traditionally as a product or graphic designer, in charge of the teams, and then they would lead the psychologists, ethnographers, e economists, statisticians, and whoever else was part of that team. They would speak design language throughout, and they would adhere to a traditional design process, because Hillary is completely convinced that this produces a better outcome. Now, Participal closed two years ago after a decade of experiments in many different fields, but its projects were designed from the outset to be taken over and run by their local communities. And this is exactly what has happened, not only in the UK, but all over the world. And if you're interested in Hillary's work, she published a brilliant book about it last year, Radical Help. And I think the US um, edition is about to come out, and I'd really recommend that you read it. Now, an equally ingenious and unexpected example of design being applied by people from a completely unexpected field is Sehat Kahani, which is a healthcare network to improve the accessibility and also the quality of healthcare for women in Pakistan. Now, it was founded by two Pakistani female doctors, Sara Karam and Ifat Safar, after they realised that a serious problem in Pakistan is the shortage of women doctors. There are more women medical students at medical school and university than men, but once they graduate, they come under such intensive family and social pressure to marry, have children and give up work, that many of them end up doing precisely that. And as a result, there are far too few female doctors to care for the large number of Pakistani women who prefer not to be treated by men. So Sarah and Ifat used their instinctive design flair, not that they would have expected ever to be complimented for such a quality, 
by designing a network of teleclinics like this one that enable female doctors like them to practice from their homes by examining patients on live video links. The patients are accompanied by local nurses throughout the consultation and they will then monitor their treatment, liaising with the doctors also by video link in their homes should they need to consult them. The concept was tested in Karachi, Pakistan's capital, in 2014, and predictably there were lots of problems, particularly when it was trialled in outlying rural networks where often the power supply was so weak there'd be frequent power cuts so the whole system would fail. Another problem was that many of the elderly patients in particular found it very hard to believe that the nice young women they were seeing on the screen were really qualified to treat them. But solutions were found to all these problems and Sehat Kahani has set up dozens of clinics in smaller cities, towns and villages across Pakistan. And indeed, the principal beneficiaries of attitudinal design may very well turn out to be people like the patients of Sehat Kahani, the populations of remote rural areas of developing economies like Pakistan that rarely benefited from conventional design practice in the past, but arguably need it the most. And design, of course, has traditionally not been seen as an obvious solution to dysfunctional social services, healthcare shortages, or plastic pollution in the oceans. Nor were independent designers ever expected to raise as much as $40 million to mount epic and very risky ecological endeavours on the scale of the ocean cleanup or doctors like Sara and Ifat to recognise that design could prove useful in their work. Now, even now, many more people, much as I hate to admit it, are far likelier to see design as a styling device or as a reason why so much plastic trash is poisoning the oceans rather than as a means of clearing it away. And if Laszlo Moulinage's ambitious and eclectic vision of design is to be realised, cliches like that have got to be squashed. The only way of doing it is for design, attitudinal, professional or otherwise, to prove its worth in its new terrain. Because why else would politicians, bureaucrats, NGOs and investors consider design to be capable of redesigning healthcare systems or to develop more efficient global ways of managing digital waste? Design will only be empowered to play a more prominent and potent role in our lives if it demonstrates that it deserves to do so. And with greater responsibility and the scale of ambition of the projects I've been talking about, it will be more and more difficult to do that, but it's absolutely essential that it happens, because otherwise design won't win the public and political support it needs to continue. And just as every thoughtfully planned and executed social and humanitarian design project will represent a step forward, every lazily designed flop will be a setback. And the ocean cleanup may well prove to be an important test case of this. If the criticism of it proves correct and the ocean cleanup fails, it will be considerably harder, not just for Boyan Slat, but other digitally empowered design activists to raise funding and secure the political support they need to mount epic projects like this in future. Conversely, their credibility will soar if the ocean cleanup succeeds in completing all or even part of what its website calls the largest cleanup in history. I have absolutely no idea whether or not it will succeed. I'm not a chemist, I'm not an engineer, so I'm not equipped to evaluate this project, but I hope for all our sakes that it does. And um, it seemed to falter a couple of months ago because it went live in the Pacific in September, but in early December, they found they had a serious problem because although the structure was very good at collecting plastic trash, it found it very difficult to retain it, so it was just drifting back into the giant garbage pan. Um, so the whole rig was taken back to dry dock in San Francisco for testing and repair and six months later it's now right now being tugged back out again, towed back out again to the great um, garbage patch um, to go back in action because they finally think they've fixed that problem but I assume it will still be a work in progress and there'll be lots of other stops and starts like that in future. But whatever happens to the ocean cleanup, 
any attitudinal designer would benefit immensely from the services of another of my favorite design endeavors. And this is the immersive research conducted by the Dutch architect Jan Willem Peterson. Now, he founded a unit called Specialist Operations, a brilliant name for a purposeful design group, as a design research agency in Amsterdam a couple of years ago. And its first project was to assess this. This is the result of what was called Task Force Aruzgan. It was a hugely ambitious, incredibly expensive, Dutch government-funded project of reconstruction for Aruzgan, which is a remote province of Afghanistan that has been devastated by decades of warfare. Now, the Dutch government spent a huge sum of money on funding the construction of new homes, schools, mosques, clinics, roads, police stations, bridges, factories, even an airport in this region. And Jan Willem Peterson spent several months traveling around it in 2015, learning local dialects so he could communicate as efficiently and clearly as possible with local people, and also studying their customs so he could encounter them with mutual respect. Now, all of the projects he discovered had been designed and constructed with very good intentions. No one involved had woken up one morning and thought, I'm going to design a really crap school and ruin the lives of generations of school children in one of the poorest parts of the world. They had all genuinely intended to design them properly. But unfortunately, they didn't. Because his investigation and his aim was simply to find out whether each of these projects was fit for purpose, whether it was fulfilling its designated function efficiently. He concluded that only 20% of them actually were. They were genuinely pro providing a useful function to the local community. 30 of them had serious flaws and would require a great deal of money to repair them and make them fit for purpose, but they were still broadly operational. But a whopping 50% had either been abandoned completely or were in such bad shape that they really couldn't be used. And the standard reason for all these failures was that the Western designers had failed completely to take account of the local context, the needs and wishes of the local communities, and also the extremes of the local climate. So as an example, there was one village in Aruzgan which was about to build a new school, its first school, and it heard that the Dutch government project, Task Force Aruzgan, was also planning to build one. Foolishly, they assumed that this European school would be better than the one they were planning to build, so they stopped construction. The Dutch school was so shoddily built, so poorly planned to meet the needs of its intended users, that it had to be abandoned after a couple of months. That village still doesn't have a school. Now, Jan Willem Peterson published his findings last year in a 300-page report which he presented to the Dutch government. I would love to think the British government would take such an epic design research project so seriously, but I fear very much that it wouldn't. And post-conflict reconstruction projects like Task Force Aruzgan are incredibly expensive, yet they're rarely seen in the countries that pay for them. Most analyses are conducted by development economists or government auditors who are admirably equipped to spot flaws in their fields, the finances of the project, um, or their flaws in terms of the local economy and its impact on the broader development strategy. But they may very well miss the design flaws that a trained designer like Jan Willem Peterson could use his design knowledge to spot, and also critically to suggest ways of avoiding repetitions in similar projects in future. Now, work like his could prove absolutely critical in assessing the efficacy of preventing yet more ambitious and expensive design projects like this one to fail so dismally in future and to ensure that the new genre of attitudinal designers can operate independently and give full vein to their talent to be as ingenious as they wish to be and to fulfill their true potential, just as Laszlo Moulinage would have wanted them to. Thank you. Right, does anyone have any questions? If you do, could you raise your hands so you can be given a microphone? Question there, Brian. Yeah, 
and then Paola. Alice, what was the response to Hillary being considered a designer? Um, initially, yeah. it was very negative um, within some areas of the British design community. I mean, she started experimenting with design in the very late 1990s and early 2000s. She's an incredibly dynamic and charismatic individual, highly intelligent, has great ideas and great networks. So she succeeded even then in raising quite substantial sums of money. She began by developing model modern schools, model modern prisons and so on. And so while she succeeded in initiating and executing those projects, she did face a great deal of controversy and hostility, less within the sort of prison and education communities, more within the sort of old school fuddy-duddy design community, who would say things like, this is all very marvelous, but it's not what designers intended to do. That has changed dramatically. Um, as her projects have been proven to be increasingly effective, um, but also as attitudes have changed and people have become much more open-minded and enlightened in their attitudes to design. And critically, she's convinced that one of the reasons why she's managed to secure so much political support and also raise so much funding for her projects is the crisis of confidence within the social sciences, which was her original academic field. Because as in so many disciplines that flourished in the 20th century and are still predominantly using those 20th century methodologies, there's a recognition that they're no longer fit for purpose, but there's absolutely no clarity or consensus on what would be better to use now. So the intelligent people in those fields are much more open to experimentation, so design has benefited. I mean, a, an institute in Norway um, a couple of months ago was formally opened, and that um, has been formed to study Hillary's work, and projects modelled on her design templates are active everywhere in the world, from Wigan, one of the most economically deprived post-industrial cities in northern England to Australia. So she's had a phenomenal impact, but as you've rightly guessed, it wasn't always easy for her. And question here. It's a continuation of Brian's question. Oh. I mean, no, because um, your, your um, non-definition of design is very sophisticated and, uh, of course, it has met challenges, I think, when you disseminate it among people. And even though you're saying that so many people in the social sciences are open-minded, people are still craving definitions. Like, they always ask you what design is and there's still this idea even though it seems like a refrain from decades ago that they're chairs, cute chairs and cars, etc. So what do you, do you mean in resistance to um, explaining that the raised fist is a form of design or to explaining that the, the system of clinics is a form of design? When you, even when you go beyond Hillary's work, how do you deal with that? Well, it's very interesting because obviously Paula, for those of you who don't know her, and I imagine most of you do, is the senior design curator at the Museum of Modern Art, has devoted her working life to combating cliches and misconceptions like that, and they are incredibly difficult to combat. Um, design as an Attitude came out nearly a year ago, and um, I wrote a book which tackled many similar issues, Hello World, Where Design Meets Life, and um, before that, which was published in 2013 and my work as a writer on design is really aimed at non-designers. I um, wrote a weekly design column for the New York Times for 12 years, um, I wrote for the Financial Times for 20 years before that and so really most of my working life has been trying to explain and enthuse people who think they know nothing about design and have less interest in it other than its role as a styling tool that they should take it seriously and there's much much more to it than that. Now, when Hello World came out, I very deliberately went to speak to promote the book at all the literary festivals, the festivals of ideas in Britain, in order to reach a much wider audience. And obviously, I used the media coverage about the book to do that. And questions like, but why is this design were asked endlessly. I assumed it would be exactly the same with design as an attitude. I knew that 
um, attitudes, so I hate to reuse the word so quickly, um, were becoming more progressive and permissive, but I wasn't sure by how much. I was really moved and hugely heartened by how much more sophisticated the general understanding of design seemed to have been. I think there are all sorts of reasons for that, but I do believe that we're heading in the right direction and the most powerful tool that we have at our disposal to take us further forward is the incredible work that designers like Boyan Slat on the assumption that the ocean cleanup succeeds, Hilary Cotton, Sara and Ifat, Andrea and Simone from Forma Fantasma are doing. I mean, when I used to talk about this eclectic concept of design 15, 20 years ago, you would struggle to find examples. You know, there were a few brilliant ones, but there were few and far between. Now I'm spoilt for choice, which is a wonderful situation to be in. OK, um, let's go to the nearest hand first. So there, 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 and there. So in Great Britain, uh, one of the great advocates of design, of course, has been Terence Conran. And of course, not only the Conran shops, and then his uh, Conran shop, it's uh, the, the Habitat stores, then the Conran shop, and of course, his restaurants, all of which were beautifully done. Has, and many books he's written, has that had an influence uh, beyond London or beyond England in terms of changing the attitudes and the way people dine or, or, or live in Great Britain today. I mean, he's also opened a museum. And yes. Well, certainly he's had, his work had a huge influence in Britain. I mean, I remember when I was a child in the 1960s, my mum would get the Habitat catalogue and you know, you get bean bags, amazing beds, duvet covers and so on, all of which seemed incredibly glamorous and continental as we used to say uh, to we poor Brits. Um, we'll soon be using such language again, of course, once we're severed from the European community. So yes, he was a very progressive force in Britain, I think particularly in the 60s and 70s. How do you think the use of empathy in the design thinking process of the Stanford D School um, can propel design as an attitude in designers today? Well, an excellent um, question. I'm not familiar, obviously, I know about the D School and a bit about its curriculum, but I'm not super familiar with it. But um, in a longer version of this talk, I sort of explain how I feel the design community needs to change in order to really make the most of all the new opportunities that are available to design. And top of that list is greater empathy. I mean, design, as I said, had tremendous achievements in the 20th century in the industrial age. You know, it was plucky and optimistic, but it was also prone to arrogance. And I think that that really has to change. And in this century, empathy is so much more important. It's such a powerful quality. It's wonderful that something, a word that seemed quite quaint and old fashioned for a long period of time is now so powerful and so influential in so many different fields, design prime among them. Thank you so much for your uh, presentation. Um, so you alluded to uh, design as an agent of change. How do you envision design to be more of a tool for vulnerable communities that haven't seen design as a tool for change? Okay, well, I think Hilary Cotton's work is a brilliant example of that, or Sara and Ifats um, with Sahat Kahani. And um, I mean, I pers Hillary is a very dear friend. She's been a huge influence on me because I find her work so valuable and inspiring. So um, I'm very taken by her justification for why design works for her projects. So if I use one example, the first big project that Participle worked on, and this would have been 10 years ago, was to work for the London Borough of Southwark, which is one of the poorest areas of London. And the council knew that it was spending a huge amount of money on providing care for the growing number of elderly people in the borough. And it also knew that that service wasn't fit for purpose, but it didn't know why. So Hillary managed to persuade 
the borough of Southwark, and also a media group to each invest half a million pounds, so um, you know, seven hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars, in to enable her to prototype a more efficient way of providing care for the elderly, actually enabling that individuals could have the care that they needed in a much more tailored and bespoke way. And critically, it couldn't cost a penny more than the old not fit for purpose system. So she assembled these cross-disciplinary teams who talked to local people to find out what was working with the old system and what they needed and wanted from the new one. And she said that where design was particularly useful in that process was that designers tend to be great communicators and also instinctively knew how to ask the right questions and to really sort of flush out um, sort of insights and so on and fresh thinking from the target market, if you like, if you're going to use commercial terms. Desi she said designers were also helpful as sort of persuaders in raising money because, you know, this was a very radical project. She needed to raise large sums of money from a media group which is answerable to its shareholders and a council that's using taxpayers' money um, and in a fairly deprived community. Um, so obviously it was answerable to them. But she found that the designers in the teams were very good at doing that. And then again, great at coming up with ingenious ideas to develop solutions and the solution which they realized early on had to be as flexible as possible to enable the service to be tailored for individual elderly people was to form what were called circles and circles were a kind of combination of a concierge service a self-help group and a social club and so in each geographic community within Southwark which is quite a big area a circle would be formed and elderly people would be invited to join it and as the system developed another member of the circle would go and talk to them would find out what they needed and wanted help with and also what they could contribute to the circle so rather than being passive recipients of council services they were actually helping other people so somebody might be great at doing their accounts but couldn't cook so another member of the circle would help them with the cooking and teach them how to cook and they would do the reverse with accounts so they were forging new relationships in a very natural and organic way um, they also organized lots of sort of social clubby things like group trips to the cinema. They found that organizing social events to encourage elderly people to make friends was a complete catastrophe. Everyone sat sullenly in a corner. Um, Hillary was completely convinced that um, it would be great if um, sort of lifestyle gurus came in to advise um, individual people as to how they could change their lives. There was total opposition to that. It was seen as far too Californian, with um, apologies to any Californians among you. I would love such a service. Well, um, and so design assembled all of this sort of motley assortment of components that made the package, which has been so successful. I think circles are still operative in 20 different boroughs in England and Scotland and in many other parts of the world. Okay, and um, Mike also has a question. Well, in, uh, in answer to that, that question about designers from not from the region, totally misunderstanding the culture, uh, Victor Papanak, who wrote Design for the Real World and was also a great design teacher, he kind of evolved from teaching American industrial designers to design for villages in Africa, for example, uh, to trying to recruit people from those communities and from those regions and train them as in design problem solving. Uh, and the result, he felt, would be much deeper understanding of the actual problems and the, the cultural ways of those regions. Yeah, and he was, of course, absolutely right, because yeah. unfortunately, you know, there's been a huge upsurge of interest in and activity in humanitarian design, so much of which has been absolutely wasted, because like the designers and architects who participated in Task Force Ruskan, they just did not understand those local communities. There's now an amazing new generation of designers and other creatives in Africa. See, Ravi Naidu, who runs Design in Darba, which has very much championed that. Um, Ravi's here with us. And so, you know, there are so many talented 
people who can address those problems directly. And I think Sara and Ifat are brilliant examples of that in Sahat Kahani. I mean, I cannot imagine a Western doctor, however well-intentioned, coming up with such a concept or running it so efficiently. So I think the same applies to other fields. I think we can have one more question. Your hand's been up and then we have to wrap up to make time for the next session. Okay, so um, in that same vein, talking about designers who have leaned too hard into their design without considering the context, the local context, um, like with Task Force Ereskan, um, do you think for potential funders, are there any warning signs that they should look for before, say, donating $40 million to a project that they're not sure might work? Well, the $40 million came from many, many different funders. I mean, many of whom through crowdfunding and donations would have given very small sums of money. I mean, it's an incredibly important and valuable question to ask, but an impossible question to answer because all you can do is sort of analyze the pros and cons, the potential of an individual design project and the ability of the people involved with it to execute it. And so obviously due diligence has to be done and as rigorously as possible. As I've pointed out, if these projects fail, it's not just a disaster for them, it's a huge setback for everyone else. And most particularly for the very vulnerable people that they're intended to help. So I think people should not embark upon them without that knowledge and a sense of responsibility that is likely to carry them through to success. But sadly, there's no magic solution to working out what will work or won't, but then maybe bringing in someone like Jan Willem Peterson at the beginning rather than in the aftermath might help. Okay, so we have to wrap up now or we'll be dragged off stage. Um, so thank you all very much. And thanks for the great questions. Oh, and I will be signing copies of Designers and Attitude in a little nook um, on the other side of the foyer. So I'll see you there.